Alan Dershowitz is possibly America's best known lawyer. He generally works for the defense. He was on the team for both O.J. Simpson and Klaus von Bülow. And you might expect him to look for any excuse. But in fact, he feels that there was a point when America went overboard. The law is a blunderbuss, it's not a scalpel. It has great difficulties making kind of calibrated, refined distinctions. It finds it much easier to say, there's no such thing as insanity, uh, therefore everybody is responsible, no matter how sick they may be, or everybody's sick, everybody is irresponsible, let's treat them all uh, in a completely understanding way. What's very difficult for the law is to say, you know, there are some people that really aren't responsible. And there are others who are more or less responsible. There are some who are totally and completely responsible. Calibration is very difficult for our legal system because it gives far too much discretion to uh, judges. Do you think there's a tendency these days in the law to avoid ascribing blame? I think there was a tendency in the law uh, toward not ascribing blame, to saying we're all at fault, we're all responsible. It was overdone during the 1980s and 1990s in the United States, which led to the phenomenon, I coined the phrase, the abuse excuse. Everybody had an excuse. Everybody was abused as a child. Everybody has a justification, a reason for why they did what they did. It got so far to the point where biographers of Hitler were blaming what he did on a poor upbringing. And I think we've seen a reaction uh, to that, finally. And uh, the legal system is not as quick to accept excuses or diversions from blame and accepting responsibility for actions. I think we see pendulum swings uh, when it comes to blame and responsibility. Uh, clearly, there's a tension. Uh, we all know that every evil has a cause, but to understand is not to forgive. So it's important that we understand, but blame plays a very important role. Fault plays a very important role. Dr. Jonathan Pincus says that almost every person he's dealt with who has committed a violent act, that there's a, there's a reason for it, um, be it kind of a mental health problem or some frontal lobe damage or because of abuse in, in childhood. You don't go along with that. No. Uh, Dr. Pincus is dead wrong when he says that all violence is attributable to either lesions of the brain or uh, bad upbringing. Some people choose evil. Some people choose violence. They have all the options in the world, and they choose the way of violence. Stalin chose violence. Hitler chose violence. Perón chose violence. Uh, these are choices. and. Uh, Al Capone, the great criminal in America, chose violence. It was a very interesting case. He killed somebody after suffering from tertiary syphilis. And people said, ah, the killing was caused by the syphilis. But what about the hundred people he killed before he got syphilis? This was a killer who also had syphilis, not a person who was a syphilitic who became a killer. Evil is, is a description that is used a lot by politicians in the USA. Um, is there any reason, do you think, why it's such a popular term or populist term? No American politician ever lost an election for being too simple-minded. Uh, simplicity is the essence. It's the economy, stupid. That's the way Clinton won. It's the terrorists, stupid. That's the way Bush is remaining so popular. If you can reduce complexities to a simple term like evil, you have won the day. And uh, presidents understand that, and speechwriters understand that. Uh, complexity is what gets you defeated for office. People say if, if uh, Al Gore had been elected president, uh, he would be looking at terrorism in a calibrated way, and he'd be saying, well, on the one hand or on the other hand, what we want is presidents who have only one hand. They don't balance. Evil, evil, or good, good, we, good, you, evil. We, our God is the good God. Your God is the evil God. We haven't improved much in the five or 6,000 years of recorded history. 
uh, go back to Roman and Greek history and the Bible and earliest times, uh, leaders always knew how to distinguish between good and evil, and it was always that we're good and they're evil. While I was in America, the trial of Andrea Yates was dominating the headlines. She drowned all five of her children in a bathtub. Although she'd been diagnosed as suffering from psychosis and hospitalized four times before the killing, a Texas jury rejected a defense of insanity and found her guilty of capital murder. If this woman doesn't meet the test of insanity in this state, then nobody does. Zero. We might as well wipe it from the books. She was suffering from a delusion and beliefs. Bizarrely, the prosecution's expert psychiatric witness, who testified that she deserved the death sentence in law, himself thinks that that law is mistaken. In clause number 883590, State of Texas versus Andrea Pia Yates, we, the jury, find the defendant, Andrea Pia Yates, guilty of capital murder as charged in the indictment, signed by the fourth person. The Andrea Yates case highlights many of the problems with our system. Uh, there's no question this was a very sick woman. And under the kind of system that I would design if it were for me to design, uh, what would happen to a woman with exactly those facts is that she'd be held responsible for behavior since she knew it was illegal to kill her children. But what would happen to her would not be punitive. What would happen to her would be therapeutic. It would ensure the protection of others, but it would not punish her. The death penalty seemed to me highly inappropriate uh, in a case of that sort. But even uh, a lifetime in prison may be inappropriate given the fact that her behavior arose out of sickness. Dietz is a nationally known forensic psychiatrist, a veteran of more than a thousand trials, hired, defense attorneys say, to send their client to her death. And yet I was the government expert who pointed out that she knew it was wrong under the law and pointed out the ways in which she met Texas criteria for being held responsible. The expert's job is to work within the law as it is. It's for other people to make arguments about what should happen, and it's for advocates to make arguments about how the law should be changed. The expert should be acting more as a technician to say, how does this case fall under the law as it is? I think that there are lots of excuses floated that shouldn't be exculpatory. I also think that uh, people who have valid excuses sometimes get convicted and punished. I think we don't have it right. I've seen juries and judges make mistakes in both directions. God knows I've seen plenty of experts make mistakes in both directions. I think this is a difficult area. It's difficult for the experts to focus on what they should be. It's difficult for uh, the fact finder to get it right. And so it's inevitable that we're going to have mistakes. And what proportions those happen in um, shift with the political winds in ways that we can't control. Experts in the law, in the workings of the mind, and in the structure of the brain can't agree about how free will operates. We can call an act evil if the person doing it was free to choose what they did, but the closer you get to the notion of freedom of choice, the harder it is to define. The experts say that for all their experience and knowledge, it's not finally up to them to lay down rules as to who's evil and who's sick. It's up to you and me. It's not easy, is it? The series concludes next week at the same time, 7 o'clock. Next up on 4, Sugar and Spice and All Things Doily, Gwyneth Paltrow's a matchmaker extraordinaire and social darling in Jane Austen's Emma. <laughs>